فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم So with the, with in the explanation of the Kitab al-Waraqat, Imam Abi Ma'ali al-Jawaini rahimahullah, he said, after he spoke about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's actions, after he had spoken about the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's actions, he rahimahullah, he mentioned ثَلَاثَةُ أَقْوَالِ Three views, I mean, three opinions, Regarding, regarding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's actions, in which no evidence has shown that it's specific to him, الذي لم يدل الدليل على اختصاصه به, that it hasn't shown that this is specific to the Messenger alaihi salatu wasallam, and this is in the Shafi'iyah according to the Shafi'i madhab. These three views stands. The first view is حمله على الوجوب. Brothers, pay attention, inshallah ta'ala. If the Prophet sallallahu does an action, and there is no evidence that the Prophet does an action, and there is no evidence that comes, and it does not show that this is specific to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is it? Is it wajib? Is it mandub? How do we deal with it? In the Shafi'iyah, according to the Shafi'i madhab, and that is the view that Abi Ma'ali al-Jawaini inclines to. He's a Shafi'i. And he is the author of the Kitab Nihayatul Matlab Fi Dirayatil Madhab. He mentions three views. The first one is Hamluhu ala al wujub. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does something and no evidence shows that it's specific to him, then we take it obligatory. Fayakun wajib and it becomes wajib. The second is Hamluhu ala al nadb, that it's recommended. So it becomes mustahab, highly recommended. And the third one is أَنْ يَتَوَقَّفَ عَنْهُ That the person withholds and he still, he, stay, he doesn't say anything about it. تَوَقُّفِيَ <coughs> means أَنْ يَتَوَقَّفَ عَنِ الْحُكْمِ بِهِ بِكَوْنِهِ وَاجِبًا أَوْ مَنْدُوبًا That the person doesn't say it's wajib and nor does he say that it's recommended. And the قول which is مُخْتَار The chosen opinion is from all of these opinions and the strongest of those is that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's actions in which he does getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he does it in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no evidence has shown that this is specific to him we take it as what? أَنَّهُ لِلنَّدْبِ that is recommended so the second قول is the strongest so it becomes mustahab and it enters into the chapters of Babu Nafli, the chapters of Nawafil. There's also another type of action that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, which the author didn't mention. The Mu'allif doesn't mention it, Abi Ma'ali al Draini doesn't mention it. And it is Al Fi'lun Nabawi, the Prophet's actions. Al-Mubayyani lil Mujmali that clarifies a ambiguous. There's another type of action of the Prophet which the author doesn't mention, and that is the action of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he clarifies an ambiguous. Like Qawluhu Ta'ala, the statement of Allah, Wamsahu, Wamsahu biru'usikum, wipe over your head. Then the author, rahimahullah, he mentions three points that he concludes this chapter with. The first one is his statement where he says, وَإِقْرَارُ صَاحِبُ الشَّرِيعَةِ عَلَى الْقَوْلِ الصَّادِرِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ هُوَ قَوْلُ صَاحِبِ الشَّرِيعَةِ Which he says, وَإِقْرَارُ صَاحِبِ الشَّرِيعَةِ The Prophet sallallahu consent على القول الصادر من أحد that comes from somebody is like the Prophet ﷺ speech. Pay attention to this. Somebody does something in the, in the presence of the Messenger ﷺ. Somebody does something. A speech. That speech is as though the Prophet said it. And the Prophet saw it 
and he never said nothing about it. He went quiet, he agreed to it. It's like the Prophet said it. The second mas'ala that he mentions is وَإِقْرَارُهُ عَلَى الْفِعْلِ كَفِعْلِهِ And an action is done in front of the Prophet. The author says this is like the Prophet's action himself. In terms of the hujjah. These two points that he talks about is both referring back to the iqrar, the consent. The Prophet's sunnah is three by the consent of the ulama. Qawl, fi'il and iqrar. They differ whether sifatu khuluqiyya and sifa khilqiyya. The Prophet's etiquette and manners should it be added to the sunnah. The Prophet's creation, he, how he looked, should that also be added to the sunnah? There's a difference. But the three that they don't differ upon is Qawlu nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet's speech wa fi'lu and the Prophet is actions wa iqrarun and the Prophet sallallahu is consent, what he consents to. Consent means sukootu nabiyyi the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is silent inda qawli ghayrihi aw fi'lihi when somebody does a action or a speech in his presence. Now, there's an issue that needs to be tackled here, which is what about if this thing is not done in front of the messenger? Does it also take the ruling of iqrar? Meaning it's not right in front of him. He's not there looking at the person. Does it take iqrar? Should we say this is the ruling of consent that the Prophet consented to it? Some ulama said yes. And some said no. And the strongest of those two opinions is that if it's done at the time of the Prophet if the Prophet didn't see it and didn't know of it, Allah did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And Allah wa ta'ala would have told the Prophet about it and that it shouldn't be done. Are you with me brothers? So anything that was done at his time alayhi salatu wasalam, it takes the ruling of iqrar consent. The author said something, a statement unrestrictedly, which needs ta'qib, it needs correction. And that is, عَلَى الْقَوْلِ الصَّادِرِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ A speech that occurs from anyone. Are you with me? Some of the scholars, they said, when he said أَحَدٍ, it shows that it's anyone. Whether it is a Muslim, or whether it's a kafir. Is that correct? And ahadin, anyone. So it does it mean that any speech that comes from any individual, it doesn't matter who it is, and that the Prophet is there, it's even if it's a kafir. Yeah? Brother say What's the answer? If you look at his definition that he gave when he was talking about iqrar, what did he say? وَإِقْرَارُ صَاحِبِ الشَّرِيعَةِ عَلَى الْقَوْلِ الصَّادِرِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ هُوَ قَوْلُ صَاحِبِ الشَّرِيعَةِ That the consent of the Messenger وسلم, to a speech of a person, a person, it can be any person. It is like the Prophet said it. So if a kafir comes and does something, something in front of the Prophet and he goes quiet, it's consent. If a, disbelie- if a believer does it, it's also a consent. All of it is consent. Is that right? A specific to the believer, yeah? Anybody else? I think uh, it is a concept. Because uh, Rasulullah says, Allah is not, there's no evil except that they tell us about it. Jameel, that's it, exactly it. It can be from anybody. The reason is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his job was to convey what was right and wrong. And he used to do that. Even the disbelievers, he used to correct them. A man came with a big, thick moustache. He cut his beard. The Prophet said to him, Man amaraka bihada, who told you to do this? And he said, My leader, the man I'm from, he told me to do this. He told us to cut our beards and let our beards, uh, moustache grow this thick. Then the Prophet he grabbed his beard and he said, Allahu amarani bihada. As for me, Allah commanded me, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to let my beard grow. Are you with me, brothers? So even the disbelief what he does, if the Prophet is silent about it, it's a consent, the Prophet will correct him. The Prophet will correct him. Alayhi salatu salam. The third mas'ala that the author spoke about is وَمَا فُعِلَ فِي وَقْتِهِ That which was done at his time فِي عَهْدِهِ 
which is the issue that we just spoke about, which is something that is done at his time. في غير مجلس not in the Prophet's gathering. وعلم به and the Prophet knew it. ولم ينكره and he didn't reject it. فحكم حكم ما فعل في مجلسه is like it was done in his gathering. And as I said to you, this masala that he takes the opinion that he holds here right now, which is that it's specific to the fact that the Prophet has to know, is not something that the usuliyin generally all accept. Some of them believe no, it has to be based on what? His time, that's enough. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah knows what's in the chests of people. So the Prophet وسلم, would have been told about it if it was wrong. Now. The author, Rahimahullah, he now goes into a fasal akhar, another unit, from the unit of usul al fiqh, and it, and it is the concept of an nasq abrogation. The author now is going to speak about what we call an nasq wal mansukh. Which is the abrogating, the one that's abrogated and the one that's abrogating. And the author, Rahimahullah, he defined it linguistically, the lexical definition, and he also defined it technically. And the author gave two meanings for the linguistic meaning or the lexical meaning. The first one is Al Izala, Waqila, and it's also said Al Naqlu. Izala is to remove, and Naqlu is to change now these two meanings he mentioned them and he is uh, he, the author is more inclined to the first of the definition the first two he's more inclined to the first one because when he spoke about the second one he used a form which the ulama call sirat tamrid as though it's it's, a, it's an opinion that he doesn't like so he likes the idea that it's called izala but what's the best definition linguistically for the word anasq is to say arraf'i Arraf is the best. The reason why we say it's the best is because it combines between the two definitions. Al izala to naqlu, which is to remove and also to change, all of them are in the meaning of the word arraf'u. So those two meanings, al naqlu wal izala, are in the definition of the word arraf'u. Does that make sense? Kilahuma, both of them, yarji'ani ila raf'i. Both of them go back to the definition of the word rafa that's its lexical meaning its technical meaning the author said he said so the author الله, he defined it as what it is the the addressing of the Sharia. The Sharia khitab means the Sharia is addressing. And that addressing indicates a dalu that shows ala raf'il hukm thabiti that it's removing a solidified, placed ruling. Bil khitab il mutakadimi with. So the ruling is being moved, the first ruling is being moved. Bil khitab il mutakadim ala wajhin lawlahu lakana thabitan. If it wasn't removed, it would have been there. There's one that's coming, there's already a ruling in place. Another one is coming, and what it's doing to the previous ruling that was there, it's getting rid of that ruling now. And it's bringing in a different ruling. But that definition of the author doesn't seem like it's very comprehensive. The better definition would be as follows. Is raf'ul khitabu shari'i. It is 
to lift a shar'i definition, a shar'i addressing. Shar'i here means al kitab wa sunnah. It's to lift it. Aw hukmihi or its ruling. Aw huma ma'an or both of them at the same time. With what? Lakin. Bi khitabin shar'iyin mutarakhin. And you're moving it and getting ready, rid of it with a later ruling. A ruling that came later. So three things is in my definition. My, definitions, my definition that I gave, it encompassed three points. Number one, marfu'un, which is the kitab al-shara'ah. The first point is something that's been lifted. The first part of my definition is something is getting lifted. What is it that's getting lifted, my beloved brothers and sisters? Three things I said. al khitab al-shara'i, which is the, the sharia is addressing or hukmuhu or its ruling or huma ma'an or both of them together simultaneously that's the first point second is what does it, what does the khitab shar'i mean brothers it means the wording are you with me the quran has wording and it has meanings right sah are you with me brothers you have to understand when you're talking about abrogation you have to know there's wordings because sometimes what gets abrogated is only the wordings the meaning's still there are you with me, brothers? And sometimes the opposite is true. So sometimes the wording, khitab al-shar'i here means what? The wording. Aw hukmuhu means its meaning. Aw huma ma'an, or both of them at the same time. That's the first one. Second thing is, there's another khitab shar'i that's removing it. Second point, my definition holds, which is a rafi'. And the third one, which is Shartul Raf'i, the condition. The condition that is that huwa ta'akhuru khitabu shar'iyi rafi' The one that wants to lift the previous ruling has to come later. Are you with me? We have to know that it came later. Are you with me, brothers? Then the author, rahimahullah, divided the naskh in three, three, three itibarat. He divided it in three. The first one is abrogation. بِعْتِبَارِ مُتَعَلَّقِهِ The author, rahimahullah, he divided the naskh into three. He divided it into three. The first one is the abrogation in terms of what it connects to. بِعْتِبَارِ مُتَعَلَّقِهِ In terms of what it connects to. Are you with me, brothers? The second type was an aqsam al naskhi bi'tibar al mansukh ilayhi. The second one is the types of abrogation there is in terms of what? Al mansukh ilayhi, the thing that it's been abrogated to. Each one we're going to speak about, inshallah. And the third one is aqsam al naskhi bi'tibar al nasikh. The types of abrogation in terms of the one that's abrogating. So let's go to the first one of the three, which is Aqsamu Nasr bi'tibari muta'allaqah bi'tibari muta'allaqi The abrogation in terms of what it's connected to, and it's two types. The first one is divided into two. And that is نَسْخُ الرَّسْمِ وَبِقَاءُ الْحُكْمِ Is removing the letters and letting the ruling stay. And the second one is lifting حُكْمُ نَسْخُ الْحُكْمِ The ruling is lifted وَبِقَاءُ الرَّسْمِ and the letters are going to remain. There's a third type that the author didn't mention, which is Nasqur Rasm Wal Hukm Man. 
lifting the rasm, the writing, and the rulings, both of them. And the reason why the author didn't mention that is because if he said each one, then of course a third one can come out of it. He doesn't deny it. Is Mimbabi Dalala to Iltizam? He left it because of that. So when I say Rasm, what do I mean by Rasm? The wording. I mean Allah wal Mabna. I mean the letter and the construction of the weddings. That goes. And Hukum, I mean Mayadulu alayhi laf, which is the ma'ana, the meaning. Are you with me, brothers? The second type of definition from the three, the second one is, is what? Aqsamun nasq, categorizing the nasq in what? Bi'atibari, al mansuq ilayhi, the thing that has been abrogated to, and that is divided into two, two types. Mansukhun, one that's abrogated, ila ghayri badalin, without any changes. It's abrogated with no change. La fi rasmihi, not in its wording. Wala fi hukmihi, and not in its what? In its ruling. Wal akharu, and the second which is mansukhun ila badalin. It is abrogated with a an exchange. Something else took its place. Fi rasmihi wa hukmihi ma'an aw ahadihima. Either in its its hukum and its rasm simultaneously, or one of the two. Then the author, rahimahullah, clarifies and explains the mansukh, that the one that's been abrogated to an exchange, it's been exchanged to something. Are you the brothers? Is two types. He says, Mansukhun ila bala ila badalin aglav. Which is what? It's abrogated to a more harsher ruling. And the next one is, Mansukhun ila bala badalin akhaffa. It is abrogated with an easier ruling. And of course, there's going to be a third type which he didn't mention, which is an nasqu ila badalin musawin. That's equal to it. Abrogation to a what? To something that is equal to it. Exchanging it with something that's equal to it. The author, rahimahullah, he only spoke about al mansukh ila badalin fi hukmihi. Remember, in his hukum. Those two which was what? Mansukhun ila badalin aghlab. Ama mansukhun ila badalin akhaf is in the hukum. It's in the ruling. That the harshness is in the ruling. And the harshness is in the what? So the ease is in the ruling. In other words, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-ana khaffaf Allahu ankum wa alim anna fikum ba'fa. Allah now knows you're weak. This is a what? The ruling before was hard. In the battlefield, each person had to fight 10 people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he exchanged it with a ruling which is easier. Which is Two people, no problem. Are you with me? But sometimes the ruling gets even more serious. This is in the hukum. Now the author didn't mention, what about in the wording? Okay, in the wording is two types, but the author didn't mention it. Which is mansukhun ila badalin min jinsihi. Which is exchanging, this is the wording, this is the letters, okay? It's two types. The first one is mansukhun. It's abrogated in a badalin min jinsi and exchanged with something like it. Something that's of its essence. And when we say something of its essence, we mean an ayah with another ayah. So the abrogation is coming from another ayah that's equal to it, which is Quran and Quran. Or hadith bi hadithin, a hadith with another hadith. The second type is mansukhun ila badalin min ghayri jinsihi. That it's been abrogated and it's been exchanged to something that's not from its essence. Like, نَسْخِ آيَةٍ بِحَدِيثٍ Abrogating an ayah with a hadith. Or, نَسْخْ حَدِيثٍ بِآيَةٍ Abrogating a hadith with an ayah. The author didn't mention those two, but they exist. 
Now we move on to the third type of categorization where the author says, Rahimahullah, وَيَجُوزُ النَّسْخُ الْكِتَابِ بِالْكِتَابِ وَنَسْخُ السُنَّةِ بِالْكِتَابِ وَنَسْخُ السُنَّةِ بِالسُنَّةِ And this is dividing the nasq, the abrogation, بِاعْتِبَارِ النَّاسِقِ based on what is the one that's abrogating. And the author, Rahimahullah, he divided it into two. The first one is قِسْمَةُ النَّاسِقِ بِاعْتِبَارِ جِنْسِهِ قِسْمَةُ النَّاسِقِ بِاعْتِبَارِ قُوَّةِ دَلَالَتِهِ that is divided into two, the statement of the author here. Brothers, I have to go fast. We have to finish this quickly, inshaAllah ta'ala. Okay, be sharp. We had a nice warm-up this morning, right? We now have to go in. We've got two more books to go through today, inshaAllah. You guys are ready, right? Yeah? Yay. The first one is Categorizing the nasikh, the one that's abrogating bi'tibari jinsi in accordance to its essence. And the second one is categorizing qismatun nasikh, the abri categorizing the one that's abrogating bi'tibaru quwati dalalatihi in terms of the strength of what it indicates. The first one is of those two, which is Categorizing the nasikh in terms of its jins is of two types. Nasikh min al kitabi wa yansakh al kitab wa sunnah. The first one of those two is categorized into two. Nasikh from the kitab. And the second, and that happens with the kitab and the sunnah. The second one is nasikhun min sunnah, the abrogation of the sunnah, and it can be done with the with the sunnah alone. As for the second one, which is the nasikh in terms of its strength of what it indicates, it's two types: the mutawatir, and it can be abrogated with mutawatir or ahad. And the second one is the Ahad, which is the, it can be abrogated with Ahad only, according to what the author mentioned. And that is not a strong opinion. Naam. The author, Rahimahullah, here he talks about what we spoke about before, which is a ta'ar of opposition. There's opposition here. What does ta'aruv mean? What's the definition for it? Ta'aruv means taqabulu dalilain. Two opposite, two evidences are opposing one another. Bimukhalafati ahadihim al akhara fi nadar al mujtahid. They are opposing one another in accordance to the observation of a mujtahid. Again, in my definition, there are four points. My definition encompasses four points. Number one, that there's a taqabul, opposition. Taqabul means what? That they're facing each other, muwajaha. The second one is, it's two evidences. Ad-dalilayni. It can't be um, uh, the view of a person and a delil. That's not called ta'aru. Your kalam sakat, it drops straight away. We're talking about two delils opposing each other. The third one is 
the opposition is occurring ala wajhil mukhalafa that there is a khilaf here it's not that they both mean the same they're synonyms or they're mutaradif it's actually that there is an opposition bimukhalafati ahadihim al akhar that they are actually opposing each other the fourth is anna anna mahalla nadhar al mujtahid it's all, it's all in accordance it's all in accordance to the observation of the mujtahid. The reason why we say that fi nadhar al mujtahid is because there's no two delis that really oppose each other in and within itself. All of this is in accordance to the mujtahid for him. It seems like it's contradicting. Are you with me, brothers? The author, rahimahullah, he explained that the ta'aruf it takes place in regards to the nutq, the utterance. Remember? And what did the author already say in the beginning when we were studying? What did he say that the nutq is? He mentions that the nutq is Allahi wa qawla rasuli sallallahu alayhi wa sallam It's Allah's speech and the messenger's speech. But this statement of the author, as the scholars say, is kharaja makhraja al-ghalib. It's not necessarily all the time. It can be other than that. But what he means by this is that the majority of the times then the author rahimahullah mentions that the oppositions are four types. The first one is At-ta'aruf bayna dalilayni amayni. That they are two generic evidences that are opposing each other. That's number one. Number two, he says At-ta'aruf bayna dalilayni khasayni. Two evidences that are specific are opposing each other. Then number three, what he said was At-ta'aruf bayna dalilin amin wa dalilin khasin. Opposition between a general evidence and a specific evidence. And the fourth one which he said is a ta'arud, opposition between a general and specific evidence on one side and a general and a specific evidence on the other side. Shall I repeat it, we'll repeat it one more time? It's four types in which the author mentions that the ta'arud occurs. The first one is a ta'arud bayna dalilayni amayni. Two general evidences are opposing each other. The second one is two specific evidences are opposing each other. The third one is a general and a specific evidence are opposing each other. And the fourth one is general and specific on one side and then general and specific on one side are opposing each other. The first two, the first two, The author proved that this is not ta'aruf. And he proved how to, re, how to deal with it. He said, فَإِن كَانَا عَامَيْنِ If both of them are general, فَإِن أَمْكَنَ الْجَمْعُ بَيْنَهُمَا جُمْعُ If we can bring them together, we bring them together. وَإِن لَمْ يُمْكِنِ الْجَمْعُ If we're not able to bring them together, بَيْنَهُمَا يُتَوَقَّفُ فِيهِمَا We withhold from it. إِن لَمْ يُعْلَمِ التَّارِيخُ If the time is not known, which one was first? فَإِنْ عُلِمَ التَّارِيخُ If the time is known, that which one is which? يُنْسَخُ الْمُتَقَدِّمُ بِالْمُتَأَخِرِ We give precedence to the later one over the, the early one. وَكَذَا إِنْ كَانَ خَاصَيْنِ إِيْ And that is if they are two specifics. So the author mentioned three levels. He mentioned الْجَمْعُ النَّسْخُ and التَّوَقُفْ He mentioned three levels. The first one is reconciliation. The second is abrogation. And the third is to say Allahu A'lam and to do tawaqquf and to withhold and to do. tawaqquf as we said it means al imsaku anul hukm li ahadima ala al akhar. You don't give any ruling to anything, you just go quiet. You say I leave it, I don't know what to do here. Are you with me? Al jam'u means what? Al ta'lifu bayna madululay dalili. Tuahimu ta'arudhuma duna duna takalufin wala ahidatin. You bring these two evidences together. But when you try to bring them together, they seem like they're contradicting each other. You bring them together without any takalluf. Takalluf means if it, it can't be far-fetched. It has to be reasonable the way you try to reconcile between it. And you're not allowed to innovate anything to reconcile it. You can't go and, and, and initiate a new ruling just so you can reconcile between two evidences. Huh? That's important.
وما الجماع فهو اتفاق علماء اهل العصر على الحادثه ونعني بالعلماء الفقهاء ونعني بالحادثه الحادثه الشرعيه واجمع هذه الامه حجه دون غيرها لقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تجتمع امتي على ضلاله وشعر الشرع ورد بعصمه هذه الامه والاجماع حجه على العصر الثاني وفي اي عصر كان ولا يشترط انقراض العصر على الصحيح فان قلنا انقراض العصر شرط يعتبر قول من ولد في حياتهم وتفقه وصار من اهل الاجتهاد ولهم ان يرجعوا عن ذلك الحكم والاجماع يصح بقولهم وبفعلهم وبقول البعض وبفعل البعض the author rahimahullah, Allah he goes into another unit from the units of usul al fiqh which is al ijma' consensus. The author defined ijma' as well ittifaq ulama ahli al asri ala haditha. Three points is what his definition consists of. Number one, annahu ittifaq there's an agreement. Two, annahu munaqidun bayna ulama al asri that this agreement is connected. It is made by the ulama of that time. And he mentions what he means by the ulama. He says, الفقهاء, The ulama we mean here by the fuqaha. And according to the ulama, like him, they mean fuqaha as the mujtahideen. We now call that mujtahid. But when they say fuqaha, they mean mujtahideen. Okay? Then he, the third thing that his definition consists of is what? And the mutaallaqahu al-waridu alayhi huwa hukmu hadithin. It's an incident that took place, a situation. And the hadith here, he means by it a shar'i issue. So it can't be worldly matter. It can't be about, we all agree that a watch shows time. Uh, so shows no, that's not, that ijma' is not what it's called. It has to be a matter related to the religion. That definition also is not a definition which we are really inclined to. The definition that we should take on board is as follows. Ittifaqu mujtahidi asrin min usuri ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ba'da mawti ala hukmu shari'i. It's the agreement of the mujtahideen of this ummah. So we don't care what the disbelievers, their their ijma'ah, it doesn't go with us. It's the ijma'ah of the mujtahidi asrin min usuri ummati Muhammad. And that ijtihad, so that ijma' can be any time in the time of ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ba'da mawti after the Prophet's death. And it is based on what? Ala hukmun shar'iyin. It has to be on a shar'i related matter. If it's a worldly issue which we agree upon, that the red light, it means to stop. This is not an ijma' which they are speaking about here. They're talking about a hukum shar'i. It has to be related to the sharia. Then the author, rahimahullah, he mentioned four issues that are spoken about when it comes to ijma' consents. The first issue that he speaks about is that the ijma' of this ummah is a proof duna ghayriha other than it. And the author, rahimahullah, He's, he's saying that the ijma' is a proof, it's an evidence, the consensus is an evidence. And the evidence for that is Qawluhu Ta'ala, the statement of Allah, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ means what? A path other than the path of the believers. And the believers here means the companions number one, because they were the believers when the ayah came down. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَإِنْتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ If you differ amongst yourself in a matter, bring it back to what? Bring it back to Allah and His. What about if we don't differ upon a matter? It's an ijma' then, isn't it? If we don't differ, then we don't have to take it back to kitab and sunnah. We already have an ijma'. Are you with me, brothers? Number two is what? The second point that He mentions here is, أَنَّ الْإِجْمَعَ حُجَّةٌ عَلَى الْعَصْرِ الثَّانِي وَفِي أَيِّ عَصْرٍ كَانَ The Sahabas, if they agree upon a matter and they have ijma' on it, this ijma' is a proof against the second generation after them, which is the Tabi'een. Are you with me, brothers? They have to follow the consensus of the Sahabas. The third point that the author speaks about, which is لا يشترط انقراض العصر some scholars, they, when they said that the consent of the Sahabas is accepted, is that once they all die, 
then we'll say that that ijma has happened now. Are you with me? It's after they all died and we lose all the companions. It has to be in Qiradul Asri, that whole generation has to go. Are you with me? So if ijma happens at a time, the mujtahideen of that time have to all die. Then we'll say this is an ijma of that era. Are you with me? This, the author, he doesn't like the idea and he doesn't believe in that. So for example, if the Sahabas agree upon a matter in an issue of the religion, it is not obligatory to look at what? That their whole generation goes. Some of them remain. And then the Tabi'een come into place. Who are from Ahlul Ijtihad. Their Ijtihad is not taken into consideration since the Sahabas have already agreed upon a matter. The fourth matter that the author speaks about is that the ijma' is correct and it's accepted when it comes from who? The mujtahideen, the scholars of ijtihad. And how is it that they can agree with each other? They agree with each other based upon speech or action. If they clearly state all of them that they are in agreement with each other, then it's accepted. If they all agree with each other by, by action, then it's also an evidence. The author then also says, And also, ijma' can be taken into consideration if it spreads. If it spreads. And the rest are silent about it. And this is called ijma' al-sukuti. And it's a hujja ala sahih It's a proof according to the strongest opinion. Like the Sahabas, they do a consensus here. And they agree upon each other in a matter and the rest are silent about it. They don't say anything. They hear what they agreed upon and they go quiet. Their silence is a sign of affirmation. We'll read with you. Because if the Sahabas differed within themselves in this matter, he would have said, I don't agree with this. This is wrong. Are you with me, brothers? But the view that says that it is strong and that it's the strongest, Many people misunderstand that Ijma' al-Sukuti is it a hujja. The scholars differ amongst themselves if the Ijma' al-Sukuti is a hujja. Do you guys understand what Ijma' al-Sukuti means? I explain it now. If it's a hujja, there's a khilaf. But you have to understand where the khilaf is and where, this, where, this, where the ittifaq is. They do differ upon a point and they agree on a point. The point that they agree upon is if the consensus is done, by way of silence, they're all silent. They believe that's not hujah straight away. But if tatawul is zaman, time goes on, and another generation comes, and no one's still objecting against that consent, they now believe that that ijma' al sukut is taken into consideration. And this is bittifaq. They don't differ on top of this. Are you with me, brothers? If another generation comes, and they don't say anything about the previous generation, what they said, and there's no one disagreeing with it, and then a third generation comes, and they also don't say anything. If a fourth generation comes and says, I don't agree with this, this is Ijma' al sukuti Ijma' al sukuti is not a hujjah, we'll say, la, 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 la. Usuliyin agree that it's a hujjah now. Because something additionally happened, which is called tatawul zaman The time in length that he went on. Now. Can I have that? Can I ask mine? Yes, story is mine. The issue that the author now speaks about is a concept called the statement of a Sahabi. Again, when he says the statement of a companion, what do we have to understand, brothers? The action of the companion is also the same. He's only saying speech because that's the most common. But it doesn't mean only speech, okay, brothers? Kharaja makhraja al ghalib. He means all the time. So the action of the companions also enter this, and also even the consent, consent of the Sahabas enter this. Anyways, if the, the speech of the companions is not a hujjah, qawlul wahid min al Sahaba, one companion's speech or action or consent is not a hujjah, on who? Ala ghayrihi, on other than him. So it's not a hujjah on another companion. Nor is it hujjah even on the generations to come. 